Hello, and welcome to Arcadia University's Histology course. And what we're going to do in this series of lectures is take a look at the muscular tissues. And in the first mini lecture, we're going to take a look at the general characteristics associated with muscular tissues. As with all of these lectures, uh, please review the objectives uh, so that you have an idea of what are the important concepts uh, that need to be uh, learned as you're going through this. Uh, the other thing is you can use these objectives as study focusing uh, questions as you go through the topic. Now, the muscular tissues are going to be the fourth and the final type of the basic tissue types that we're looking at within the course. And so we, we've talked about the epithelial tissues where we have cells close together forming sheets within the body. We talked about the connective tissues where we've got uh, essentially cells that are scattered with extracellular matrix uh, between them, extracellular material uh, between them, holding the body together. And we just finished up with the nervous tissues, which are capable of sending electrical and chemical signals throughout the body for controlling what the body's going to be doing. And now we're going to focus in on the last of the, the muscle types, I'm sorry, the last of the tissue types, which are going to be muscular tissues. And so with the muscular tissues, what we're going to be looking at are going to be tissues that are structurally and functionally specialized for contraction. And the way that they're going to be doing contraction is that they basically have specialized protein filaments called myofilaments that are going to be found within their cytoplasm. And so what happens is we in essence have thin filaments, which are primarily actin and actin-associated proteins, and thick filaments, which are myosin and myosin-containing, uh, myosin-affiliated proteins. Uh, that are going to come together and by the interaction of these thick filaments and thin filaments, the interaction of these myofilaments, we're going to allow for controlled contraction to occur, controlled shortening of the myofilaments and in doing so shortening of the muscle and contraction of the muscle. Now we're going to focus in primarily on skeletal muscle in this first uh, mini lecture. And so if we take a look at this kind of going from that gross anatomical muscle into the muscle cells itself, what we're going to see is that the skeletal muscle cells are going to be long cylindrical cells, normally unbranched, and they're going to be multinucleated. And so that means that we're going to have a very, very long cell with multiple nuclei within it. And that nuclei is going to be peripherally located and flattened up right below the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane of a muscle cell is going to be referred to as the sarcolemma, sarco for muscle. And so sarcolemma is going to be the muscle cell membrane. And then inside of that, we're going to have the sarcoplasm. Sarcoplasm is going to be the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Now, with a skeletal muscle cell, essentially what we're going to see is going to be a cytoplasm or sarcoplasm that is filled with lots and lots of these myofilaments. And these myofilaments are going to be organized uh, in a nice repeated way, which is going to give it a striated appearance. And so it's going to have almost like a crystalline structure, a repeated structure to these myofilaments, giving it a striped or striated appearance. Now with skeletal muscle, it's important to recognize that a single skeletal muscle cell is also going to be referred to as a muscle fiber uh, in many of the textbooks. If we take a look in more detail about what's going on within the cell, the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be the endoplasmic reticulum of a muscle cell. And the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be important because it's going to be involved with sequestering uh, calcium ions. So it's going to be storing calcium ions and more importantly extensions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum called the terminal cisternae are going to be located uh, at the, uh, the boundaries uh, of the eye bands excuse me, uh, the boundary between uh, the I band and the A band. And they're going to have these extensions they are going to be referred to as the terminal cisternae. And they're going to be important for both the storage of calcium as well as the release of calcium to trigger uh, muscle contraction. So if we take a look at skeletal muscle, what we're going to have is what's referred to as a triad. And that's going to be the controlling element for muscle contraction. We're going to have a T-tubule which is going to be an invagination of the sarcolemma. So we're essentially going to have the cell membrane, the plasma membrane, is going to dive down into the sarcoplasm, into the cytoplasm, uh, at the AI junction. 
and in this case the T-tubule is kind of that central structure and then on either side of that we're going to have a terminal cisternae or an extension of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so a triad is basically two terminal cisternae plus one T-tubule and it's going to be this element then that is going to be involved with controlling muscle contraction by essentially controlling uh, the release of calcium into the cytoplasm. We take a look at the organization of those myofilaments. We said that the first element was going to be the thin filaments. And the thin filaments are going to be actin and associated proteins. And so actin, if we take a look at it, is essentially going to be like a bead-like molecule. So it's going to be a long protein with individual beads that are coming together into a long filament. Now, the associated proteins are going to be important for regulating the interaction of actin or the interaction of these thin filaments with the myosin and the thin filaments. And so what we're going to have is essentially that green molecule over there on um, the right-hand side is troponin. And troponin, that, that larger green molecule, is going to be important because it's going to be able to respond to calcium. It's going to be a calcium binding protein and it's coupled to tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is that thin green molecule that's extending across and kind of draped across uh, the active beads. Now tropomyosin in a relaxed muscle is going to block the active site of the actin. It basically blocks the site where myosin and actin are going to interact. In order for actin and myosin to interact, actin has to be able to be bound by the myosin molecule. And so if it's blocked, we can't have that interaction occurring and no contraction is going to be occurring. When calcium is available, calcium will bind to the troponin, Trop troponin moves the tropomyosin out of the way, exposes the actin active site, and essentially allows actin and myosin to come together and interact. So that's the thin filament. The thick filaments are going to be myosin and myosin-associated uh, proteins. We're focusing in primarily on myosin. Okay, myosin is a long, if you want to think about it, almost golf club-shaped uh, polypeptide. Within the head of the golf club, we're going to have uh, the ATP binding site. So we're going to have uh, an ability to interact with ATP, an ability to interact with essentially energy within the cell as well as the actin binding site. So it's going to be the head of the molecule that interacts with the actin thin filament. And then the shafts of the golf club shaped molecule are going to be projected towards the thick filament bundle and are basically going to be holding this entire structure together. So the shafts are going to be towards the, the central structure, the heads are going to be out towards the periphery and allowing it to interact with the thin filaments. So if we take a look at this in a good striated muscle, like a skeletal muscle, what we're going to see is that the thin filaments and the thick filaments are going to come together in a repeated pattern, which is going to be referred to as a sarcomere. And so if we take a look at a sarcomere, either on an artist rendition on the bottom or an electron micrograph at the top, we can see that it has a distinct staining pattern. And that distinct staining pattern is going to be based on what's going to be going on within these myofilaments. And so as a starting point, we're going to look at the Z line. That Z line is that dark kind of transverse line that's going to be present there. And that's going to be an anchoring point for, <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be an anchoring point for those thin filaments. And, and on the bottom diagram, it's the green point is going to be the Z line. And we're going to have the thin filaments, the red filaments, that are going to be extending out either towards the left or towards the right. Uh, now, the important thing to recognize is this is going to be repeating structure along the length of these myofilaments. And so we're choosing the Z-line as the boundaries just kind of arbitrarily. Uh, we could start at any point and go to the equivalent point in the next sarcomere. But we're looking at this as the Z-line as the, the, the identifying point for the sarcomere. Now, the Z-line is going to be bisected by... I'm sorry, the, the Z-line bisects the I-band. The I-band is going to be essentially the lighter staining region. And so if we take a look at it, we got the Z-line, that anchoring point, and we got some light stuff to the left and light stuff to the right. The light stuff is going to be the I-band, 
and these are going to be only the thin filaments, only the actin and the actin associated proteins. Okay, and so if we take a look at this, we're anchoring the actin, we're anchoring the thin filaments with the Z line, and they're going to go to the right from one mile, uh, one sarcomere, and go to the left for the adjacent or neighboring sarcomere. Now, if we take a look at that darker staining region, kind of towards the center of that, so we've got the, the very thin Z lines, is that dark transverse point, and then we've got the broader, what's going to be referred to as the A band. And that's going to be towards the middle of each sarcomere, and it's going to be darker staining because we've got a lot more protein units there that are going to be present, a lot more protein structure, and it's going to be the region where we're going to have these thick filament bundles. And so what we can take a look at then is that this A band then is going to be representing the thick filaments, but keep in mind that it's going to overlap with the thin filaments because we need the thick filaments and the thin filaments to come together and interact to allow for muscle contraction to occur. If we take a look at this at the center of the A band, we're going to see kind of a, a lighter staining region, which is going to be referred to as the H band. And that represents just the shafts of that golf club shaped molecule. Uh, the heads are going to be in that darker staining region, kind of peripheral to that. Uh, within the A-band. And then the M line at the center of the H-band, we've got lots of terms coming up here, but take a look at it, draw it out, sketch it out, and you see all these things together. The M line is essentially the anchoring point for the shafts of the golf club molecules coming from the left and the shafts of the golf club molecules coming to the right. So they, essentially the M line is the equivalent of the Z line. The Z line is doing it for the thin filaments. The M line is doing it for the thick filaments. Okay, and that finishes up our explanation of the kind of organization of the skeletal muscle. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.